Okay, it's Dr. Morton, and I'm uh, recording the lecture for um, Thursday, the um, 11th of November. And uh, here's the syllabus. And so, as you know, uh, we're coming up with a test on Friday. Uh, that's on the 13th, test two. We were supposed to cover 10 1 today, but we, we're past that. In fact, I think we're already to 11 um, A or B. Um, <clears throat> the test is going to cover. Uh, units 4 through 10. I think earlier I said 4 through 8, but we've actually covered it all. So we're in, there's only 25 questions. There might be one question on, one or two questions on some of the later stuff. But I'm going to go th through it all again today. I went through it on Monday and kind of told you what you needed to know, kind of looking at the test questions themselves. And I, I'm, now I'm just going to go through the material more generally. Okay. The test is all done, ready to go. It should be live uh, at, at, uh, midnight on Friday morning. So like at 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 001 a.m. Friday morning, it'll be available. And it'll be available all the way until midnight Friday. You get 90 minutes to do the test, um, 120 if you're uh, uh, one of the DS students. And um, the um, that it's pretty straightforward. Ten of the questions are specifically related to the to the uh, um, to the word file that contains the two listings A and B, both for carry look ahead adders, both in Verilog. Um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> so you should know. Uh, you sh so you should be able to. Um, uh, yeah, you should. Uh, so you, you can go you can look at that document today start it now and you can look at it all week uh, until you take the test on Friday and that's fine. Um, uh, so you should spend some time looking at the carry look at data but there are just 10 questions on it and some of them you could do even without looking at the listings although most of them do relate to the listings. The listings are slightly different. You should note the differences and see if you can understand the implications of the of the differences. That's really kind of what this is about. Um, and then hopefully you're working on your final project and you have all your labs done. You, you've uh, either demoed them in person or you've sent the video. The last lab, the KL, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, oh, sorry. I mean, yeah, the last lab, which is the SDK lab, that, that, uh, uh, that lab you do not have to demo it. All you have to do is uh, is fill out the, uh, the 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 turn in sheet and turn that in. Uh, but that it's kind of an optional lab, really. I do encourage you to do it though, because it's very unique. Uh, the only reason I'm not making it mandatory is I I want everybody to have plenty of time to do the final project. Um, okay, the SDK lab. In order for it to run, you must have the board file loaded in your edition of Avado. The Vavados in the second floor lab in the engineering building do have the board files loaded. And you have to select the board file when you start your lab. So and the board file would be like the Nexus 4 DDR or the Nexus 4 7A or whatever it is, uh, 7100, I forget. Uh, whatever that, uh, it, I think any of the boards you have should work with the Nexus 4 DDR board file. But in any event, uh, uh, make sure you uh, make sure you do uh, select the board file, and and if you do that, you should be in good shape. Okay, um, all right. With that, I'm just going to do this review. We're just going to kind of go through it fairly quickly. I'm really just going to hit the highlights. I'm not going to spend much time on kind of low level details. All right. So first, uh, we'll start with unit four. If I can get this, okay. There we go. Okay, and I'll shrink myself down a little bit more. Oh. All right. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so 
we'll talk about uh, the literals. So the main thing to remember here, and, and I'm not going to ask any serious pimp questions on this, but you just remember that these literals can get crazy when you start talking about signs and you don't have uh, and you and you have a and you have a bigger number of bits specified than the information you provide to fill the bits in, and then it can get a little goofy. What happens? Whether it goes sign extended or whether it doesn't. Um, when you make these, when you make them uh, negative and twos, and which makes them twos complement, that really creates some some problems. But as long as you don't go there, it, these are pretty straightforward. Okay, so the first thing is size. If size is not specified by default, it's 32. Then you have an apostrophe. Then you have whether it's going to be signed or not. And if you say it's, and you can put a little s or a big s, that means it's signed. Then that means it's twos complement. And of course, that's when it gets a little crazy. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, so a better way to do it is just go ahead and 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 don't bother with sign, but just go ahead and pick the uh, pick the the binary values that you need and put those in. Uh, and then, if you want to use it as a two's complement number, that's fine. It won't, you know, that'll it'll work. But once you call, cause it call uh, put in the little s or the big s, then it, it it gets a little crazy. The default, of course, is unsigned. Radix then. Um, the default's decimal, so if you don't specify it, it will be interpreted as a decimal. Uh, you can specify binary, octal, hex, or decimal, B-O-H-D, and they can be upper or lower case. And then the value. These are the actual values. Now note, the size here is always in binary bits. Let's see. We'll... So it's not, it doesn't represent the number of hex bits or decimal bits, or Sorry, hex digits or decimal digits. It it definitely speaks to uh, the number of binary bits. So you could have 32 here, and then you could just have eight hex bits, and that'd be fine. That's totally okay. You would have filled the entire 32 bits. Um, you if you have 32 bits here, and you don't have a, a, enough uh, bits defined in your in your value, then then it's going to uh, it's going to do different things depending on whether it's signed, negative, and various other things. So, um, so that's where you can get into trouble. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so the value is the only non-optional part in the tick, I guess. Okay. When you specify the binary bits, you can use zero ones. You can use an X for you don't know. You can use a lowercase or uppercase, and you can use Z, lowercase or uppercase. You can use an underscore. An underscore is just a separator to, to improve readability. So you can put in the, the, the binary bits in groups of four with underscores to separate them. And the underscore uh, doesn't have any effect on anything except it uh, makes it more readable. And then the question mark uh, uh, becomes basically a don't care. So when you synthesize things and the question marks there, then the, then the, the, the synthesizer is going to treat it as a as a as a don't care, basically. All right. Okay. So, um, moving on. Um, okay. I think that's about all I really want to um, talk about. Remember, if you don't if you don't specify the number of bits, it's assumed to be thirty two, and Verilog does expand the value to fit the size working from least significant bit to most significant bit. And uh, if the size is smaller than the value, then it's going to truncate and it won't give you any warning. If the size is larger, then the most significant bits of the value are filled. Regardless of the most significant bit being a zero or one, zero filling is done unless you're using two's complement. In other words, unless you specify signed. Um, so, and the, so if the, yeah, so if, uh, if, however, if that most significant bit is X or Z, it's going to be X or Z extended. But, re, but regardless of whether it's 0 or 1, it's going to be 0 extended. All right. So, uh, I'm not going to go through these examples. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the sign thing. You, you can remember, uh, 
if you put in a minus four and you make it signed, it, it can get goofy. Uh, I just uh, just be very careful on how an explicit sign is interpreted. And if you're going to use a minus sign, then you better go in and pay strict attention to how that's going to be uh, because it gets definitely goofy. All right. Um, and I'm not going to go through these examples. Uh, okay, design examples. Remember, we normally want to separate our, 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 our design into the controller path and the data path. Um, and as much as we can, we like to do that. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the data is part of the controller path. Um, so, but if you can, as much as you can, that's a good strategy. Okay. Um, You've used the seven segment coders. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, <clears throat> we normally we normally display the, the BCD digits, but you can also display the hex digits. You just have to remember if you display the hex digits, you generally uh, want the nine to not have the bar underneath because you, you're going to use that for the G, but you normally do want the six to have the bar over the top because otherwise it's going to look like a B. Uh, okay, you remember binary code of decimal. Uh, the only uh, again, I'm not going to ask you questions about this, but you just remember uh, you need when you do binary coded math, you have to adjust for six, um, and you have the upper six A B C D E F that aren't aren't valid because they exceed zero through nine. And uh, okay, um, yeah. Okay, so here's an example of the seven segment display for the hex value for the decimal values, but you've already done it for the hex values, so you should be all over this. Okay, remember whenever you overflow a nibble, you have to add six and then make sure you carry to the next digit. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go through this. Um, Remember that when you specify your state graphs, uh, you really want to you you don't want to have uh, you you don't want to leave uh, something unspecified. That does create a little problem, uh, and that this is a good example. If they're both zero, you stay in SK. But what if they're both one? Then where do you go? And see, it doesn't specify that the way it's written, so that that can create some problems, and you don't want that. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go through. Um, okay, single pulsar. Uh, this is just a little circuit to show how we could debounce a push button. Um, and basically, the way we debounce it is we just put a flip flop in the circuit. The flip flop only changes on the clock. And so, uh, if, if the clock's running pretty fast, we should be able to catch even a fairly quick push and latch it into the flip flop. And so that's that's one way that works. Um, and you also use this synchronizing circuit so that you're not uh, that, so that you don't have a lack of certainty about whether the D input is good or not. And all, that's all this does. It basically makes sure that the D is good. Okay, multiplier. We looked at we looked at uh, these. I'm not going to go over this much uh, because for starters they don't. There's a bunch of the. There's only it's only partially. Is, is implemented here. It's not really a good implementation. But the thing to remember is that it just shifts and it checks the multiplier. And if the multiplier digit's zero, then it then it doesn't add, it just shifts. If the multiplier digit's a one, then it does this addition. And notice these lines are bi-directional here. They don't show you how that works or anything like that. So it's, it's I don't know, I, I don't see the big benefit. All right. And, uh, and then what they do, they show that they can divide up the data path and the, and the uh, control path. And here it is. Again, I'm not going to go through this. Um, so, yeah. So, so here's where you get everything started. And then uh, if the multiplier bit, bit uh, is a 1, then you do these steps. But if it's a if it's not, then you do these steps. Okay. And so, uh, and this just shows how you can use a counter. 
because you have the redundant steps. So I, I, I don't, I, I don't think students get a whole lot out of this. So I'm not going to spend much time on it. An array multiplier. This is really important. You need, you definitely need to know how to, how to, how to look at this, uh, and see how it makes sense. And basically, here's what it looks like when you implement it with gates. Notice you can use AND gates and half adder, full adder. The half adder just doesn't have a carry in. That's really the only difference. And uh, and then you you determine the critical path through here. And uh, so this four bit four by four array multiplier, sixteen AND gates, eight uh, uh, full adders, and four half adders. And then you look at the critical path. They're the half adders. And then you look at the critical path. It's it's eight adders plus one AND gate. So the delays of eight of the adders plus one AND gate. And that, that can really add up if you have a lot of bits. Okay, and then here's the code for it. I'm not going to go through this. Sign fractions. I'm definitely not covering this. This is just torture. That's why we have the IEEE 754 standard. Uh, and generally, that's 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 what you should implement if you have to do any kind of complicated math, uh, particularly with you know signed fractions. Oh my goodness! Then you definitely need to use uh, the IEEE standard. Okay. Then uh, let's see what else. Okay, I, we're just going to shoot through this. So we have, um, yeah, and I, I'm not going to go through these. These these four-digit integer, four-digit binary fractions in two's complement, uh, it's just insane. And then when you look at kind of what they have to do to make these things work, uh, it's really crazy. So multiplication, you, you, you do different things when you have plus times plus, minus times plus, plus times minus, and minus times minus. And, and I'm not going to go through this again because I would never test you on this and I would really hope that you wouldn't have to mess with it. And then this is the two's complement multiplier. So now we're going to multiply sign numbers. And it gets complicated. And uh, so anyway, uh, and this is, and again, half the hardware is even missing still because it doesn't explain how these bidirectional lines even work. So I'm not getting too excited about it. So the 4 by 4 shift and add multiplier. So we got four, four things that are redundant. So we'll maybe... Uh, combine them with one circle and um, all right and so I'm gonna quit here I mean not quit but just press on I, I really don't we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this divider I'm not gonna not gonna spend any time on this I'm just gonna skip through it all right I think that's uh, yeah so these are just terminologies addition we, we have an aug end and an add end subtraction we have a menu end and a subtrahend Multiplication, we have a multiple can and a multiplier, and the answer is the product. And here we have a, divide, a division is divided, uh, a dividend divided by the divisor. It gives you a quotient. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, so this is, uh, I kind of forgot what we were doing here. Um, anyway, uh, so we have a high speed A to D, and then we have an unknown block A, an unknown block B, and an unknown block C. This was uh, some kind of test, I think. Uh, so uh, don't worry about that. Okay, next. Um, so this is registers and nets. I think this is not the next one, so we'll do the next one. And, um, okay. No. Okay, sorry. I'm having trouble here. Okay, uh, why is this a problem? I, maybe maybe I maybe I've got the right one and I just didn't know it. All right. All right. 
sorry. Okay. Oh, it is. Okay, that is the right one. All right. Okay, SM charts, microprogramming. I really want you to pay attention to this. I actually don't think there are any questions on the test about SM charts, uh, but uh, I probably should have put one. But anyway, um, let's say we're not. Yeah, we're not doing this. Okay. Uh, this was just to remind you in the ROM lab, it, when you add a clock, it really simplifies your design. And when you don't have a clock, it, you'll see your schematic goes crazy. All right, so we're going to talk about SM charts and how you can use them to uh, to realize your circuit. And I might say, I probably won't say a lot about uh, microprogramming. Uh, we talked about that already. It, it's microprogramming. It's kind of a, uh, it's kind of not all that, not used all that much, but, but really, we're doing the same thing. We just have different names, and it's and it's handled a little differently. But we definitely have, uh, we definitely have a, a little micro machine that runs underneath uh, the code, uh, underneath the, the 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 assembly language code, and that's what actually executes every instruction. And the only, and the reason we do that is because uh, it's really about the only way you can can effectively pipeline things. And, and really uh, begin to optimize things um, is to set it up like, to do branch prediction and conditional executions and all that. You really have to have these little micro machines. So whatever you want to call them, it, they're not microprogramming is kind of a thing separate from that, but it's very similar to that. Um, so anyway, so th we're not going to talk about that. Okay, SM charts. So they stand for the uh, state machine charts, and they can also be called algorithmic state machine charts, although I never call them that. Uh, they look a lot like flow charts, and uh, they can substitute for state graphs. If you have a state graph, you should be able to directly write your SM chart. The only difference is the state graph normally doesn't have the, the flip-flop encoding uh, labeled onto it, but the SM chart should have that because that's what makes it so powerful. All right. Um, so uh, the the main advantage in my mind of SM charts over state graphs is that you can that you don't have to go through the state table transition table K maps and equations. You can write the equations directly. So I, I think that is a very powerful feature. A state chart an SM chart always has uh, a state box, and a, a, the chart's always made up of blocks, and every block has has one state box and only one state box. Now, it may not have anything else, but it can have two other things. It can have a conditional blocks where it basically takes inputs and changes the behavior based on the inputs. And it can have conditional output blocks, where, which are basically mealy outputs if you're going to have any. The, uh, the more outputs are going to show up here in part of the output list in the state box. And above the state box in each block, we have the flip-flop encoding. Whether it's one, two, three flip flops, that's where it goes. Four flip flops, whatever. All right. And our decision box, usually just the input variable can be zero or one. So that's what really, if it's zero, we go one way. If it's one, we go the other. Here's an example block. You can see that there's a condition decision box here, decision box here, and decision box here for x1, x2, x3. And there's a conditional for Z5 here, conditional output. Conditional outputs for Z3 and Z4. But Z1 and Z2 are assigned. So there are more outputs, and they're assigned to the state box, whereas Z3 and 4 and, and Z5 are uh, mealy-type outputs. Um, OK, uh, so um, we'll do this chart. So here, here's, a, here's some code, but here's really the, the, the SM chart. And, so our first block is here. It's S0. There's no more outputs, but there is a melee output of start. If you get a start, uh, then you go to load. That's a that sorry. This is a this is a decision box. Starts an input. If you get start, if it's a one, if start continues to be a zero, you stay here. When starts a one, you go to you you have a conditional output of load, and then you go to S1. And then in S1, you check the multiplier digit. That's your decision box. If it's a one, you add, and then you, and then you shift. If it's a zero, you just shift. In both cases, you count. Uh, you check k. Uh, if k is is become one, then you're done, and you output uh, done, and S3, and then that brings you all the way back to state S0, and you wait here until you issue a new start signal. All right.
you can see we've drawn color boxes around each of the blocks. So here are the blocks, block one, block two, block, block, well, block zero, block one, block two, block three. Yeah, so, um, so when you want to derive the next state equations, it's very straightforward. You take all the states where you, your flip-flop encoding for your, for your first flip-flop, in this case, say Q, Q1 is a one, or when we use letters for flip-flop, say where A, flip-flop A is a one, and, 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 then, uh, and then write the equations for all the, all the paths into that, uh, into all those blocks where A is one. And then you do, uh, and you just order those together. And that gives you the next state equation for flip-flop A's D input, assuming you're using D's. And then uh, you keep, you do the same for, uh, for each flip-flop. And uh, eventually you have then uh, a state equation, the next state equations for each uh, of the flip-flops, A, B, C, D, however many. All right, so here's an example. Notice our flip-flop encoding. Uh, zero, zero, so A prime, B prime, A prime, B, A, B. So uh, this output ZA, that's just going to be A prime, B prime. ZB is going to be A prime, B, and ZC is going to be A, B. And then um, the, so we have to look at all the paths into ZA. So we have a path from S0 going through a x of 0, uh, we'd stay here. And um, so, so again, to do the state equations, all we have to do, uh, we, we want to do a. Well, the only place where a is a 1 is here. It has uh, this path into it and uh, this path in. So it's got two paths in. One comes from uh, a prime b x, and the other is a b x. And so you add those together, and that's your A input, and they simplify to BX, so that's fine. And then B has two nodes. It has this A, B, A, A, A prime BX, ABX, plus uh, one path into this one, which would be A prime B prime X. And that's, that's how you do B. And then your conditional outputs, uh, they're, just, uh, they're just basically, it's going to be uh, A, B, uh, x prime for z1, a, b, x for z2, and that's all you have to do. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm just going to skip past this. I think we're, we're, yeah. And, yeah, okay, I'm not going to really go through the microprogramming. Uh, yeah, we'll skip this. Okay, uh, you can go back and review it if you want. I'm not going to ask you any questions. Um, but you could see uh, with the microprogramming, uh, if you use this single address microcode, and then you can save a fair number of bits. Okay, um, all right, next one. All right, next one is... So, uh, all right, so programming with uh, FPGAs. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about cascade chains and carry chains, um, and then just uh, uh, a little bit about dedicated memory, um, cost of programmability. All right, so our, our chip uses, uh, uses lookup tables. And uh, we have LUT sixes. We have two LUT sixes for in every slice, a couple of relays and, and some multiplexers. And we also have carry chains and cascade chains. Um, so uh, if you want to implement um, a 4 to 1 MUX using an FPGA, it's kind of expensive. So that's one of the reasons why we like to include MUXs in our, in our uh, modules. Yeah, I, yeah, and so for to make a four to one mux, it takes three two to ones, just like this, and that's how you would do it with your 
uh, mow the plexus. So it would take two slices to make it work. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. If you use the F, if if you use the um, if you use the the LUT the LUT fours to, to make the mucks, then it's a little different. And here's a LUT three simplifies a little bit. Anyway. So this is what you're trying to make, and this kind of shows you how it does it. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Uh, we already talked about that a fair amount. So to do a 4 to 1 MUX using an FPJ, it's expensive to create a 4 to 1 using LUTs. Uh, if you use uh, 3 LUT 4s, it takes 48 static RAM cells, whereas uh, um, 40 in the second design, where you have a LUT 3. But, um, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about shift registers too much either. Uh, Shannon's decomposition, you should kind of remember that. You can divide any, any in this case, six variable function into two five variable functions. One with uh, multiplied by a prime, one plus a prime. All right. Um, and then sh same with Shannon's decomposition, you just factor out one of the variables and, and, uh, and that, and you divide it so you have you have one where a is is a prime where a is considered zero, and you have one where a is considered one, and then you combine those to generate the next value of z. Okay, and then you can just keep going. Um, all right, I'm not going to spend any more time on Shannon's decomposition because I think you've seen this. Um, Yeah, and here if you want to add additional ones. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but um, okay, carry chains. So one one of the things that we commonly do is add carry chains and uh, and cascade chains. So uh, it and it really, if you have a carry ch carry chain involved, it really can decrease the overhead of implementing. Uh, functions with multiple bits, and basically it looks like this: you have your you have your slice here, and then then you have your dedicated carry chain, and it sends stuff out to the program and to the carry chain, and so this these dedicated and they're just they're just basically AND gates, like this, and they can also be then we can uh, we can. We also have what are called cascade chains, very similar to the carry chain. Uh, here it's using AND gates, here it's using OR gates, sometimes exclusive OR gates. Um, so if, if an OR operation needed 32 variables, how many LUT4s would it take? Well, and how many with cascade chains? So 11 if you don't have the cascade, 8 if you do. So you can really save a lot of, a lot of uh, LUT4s. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so that's one of the reasons why these cascade chains are included. They really do uh, make things, and they, they, uh, the or is the most common, but some have and, some have or, some have both, or two different cascade chains. All right. So, uh, Xilinx normally use slices, and they're up to six variable lots, maybe seven variable lots. I don't know. Uh, Altera uh, uses what are called logic elements instead of slices, and they have four variable lookup tables. Actel uses what's called versatiles, and it, those are mostly multiplexers. All right, so I'm not going to, this is basically what our, our Xilinx slice in the vertex line looks like. We're using the, uh, uh, we're using the, the, um, we're, we're using the Artrix. So it's a little different than the Vertrix uh, because we have lot sixes. Uh, so there's 64 entries, not 16. 64 entries here, but otherwise they're somewhat similar. They do have the carry logic out, uh, and then they have these multiplexers and a couple of flip flops. And this is a slice, and um, yeah. And here's an Altera logic element, a lot four carry chain logic, control logic, and a flip flop and an output logic. Okay, and then this is how the versatile gets programmed. These are the 
these switches are flash. The nice thing about Actel is that uh, that it, you flash it, and once it's flashed, then it's going to hold that program, and you don't have to every time you power it up, it's it's already programmed. So that's kind of nice. Um, and uh, the uh, the early FPGAs didn't have any dedicated memory, but now we do, and we we have set aside memory that's just a big block, and that's so uh, you can do like an SDK lab, and you can create a soft core, and you can put your code in that block, or you can store a big table there, or lots of different things. Whereas uh, uh, in the old days, we just had to use the bits and unused LUTs, and uh, and of course when you have two LUT sixes in a in a slice you've got 128 bits in that slice. So that's actually, not, you know, that's a fair amount of memory per slice. But, uh, so, so we definitely uh, do dedicated memory now. And the distributed memory, which is basically cannibalizing unused LUTs to store information, uh, we still do that too. But um, the need is less because uh, we have these uh, uh, dedicated memory arrays. Okay, I'm not going to go through that. That just talks about how much RAM you can get. And, yeah, so, um, okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. Mostly because we have so much uh, block memory these days, we probably don't use LUT-based RAM all that much. All right, so I'm not going to mess with that. Okay, that's done. And um, we'll do the next one. Okay. And the cost of programmability. So how many how many RAM cells does it take to program these things? Now this is a lot four, so sixteen. But we have lot sixes, so that's sixty four. Another sixty four, so that's one hundred twenty eight. We don't have this this lot three thrown in. Uh, but we do have a bunch of multiplexers. Each one of them, if they're a two to one, they take at least one bit. And if they're four to one, then they take two bits. And then we have flip flops. And this is, uh, this talks about how many bits you have. And this these are the Xilinx chips. I mean, uh, sorry, these are the, uh, nope, we don't have, yeah, we don't, sorry, we don't have the R tricks. Um, all right, how do you determine your, how much your FPA, FPGA can hold? Uh, how do you compare FPGAs? This is really complicated, but we talk about uh, equivalent gate counts, and it has to do with, you, you pick sort of some, some design that you can fit into the FPGA, and then the question is, how many copies can you fit in? And then you know how many gates were in the ASIC, so then you just multiply by that number. Um, so, but a better way to do it is using these prep benchmarks. The prep is a, this is a, uh, uh, it's a nonprofit consortium made up of a bunch of the uh, FPGA companies. And basically what they do, uh, they provide these benchmarks uh, for programmable logic, so you can kind of compare them. But they're still different, and, it, and obviously it's, no comparison is perfect. When they're really different, but here's here's some of the things in the pep in the the prep suite. Uh, all right, um, synthesis tools the way they work they basically go statement by statement, and they uh, they they create the registers for for reg registers. They uh, case statements result in multiplexers. Uh, any kind of adding you get an adder. Uh, and then anytime you're shifting, you get a shift register and et cetera. And then they put it all together and make it work. Um, all right. One of the things you have to remember is that you have to specify all possible cases. And if you don't, then that, that's going to leave, that's going to create some problems. Um, all right. I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but the unintentional latch uh, happens when you you have, you, you have case A, 1, 0, 1, 2, but you don't specify 3. And even though you specified default, you didn't specify a value for the output for B. So that's a problem. And so then you have to create a latch. And it's usually a gated D latch to make this work. All right. Um, all right. I think I'm going to shoot through this a little bit faster. Uh, we talked about comparators. We talked about different synthesis examples. 
um, this is how you would, uh, if you want to do, uh, is uh, A equal to 3. Well, then this is one way you can do it with just a single AND gate. Um, and the synthesizer does a lot of optimization. Uh, it also, it, it can, you can optimize for minimum chip area, maximum speed, uh, minimum power consumption. Uh, typically, however, the faster it goes, uh, then the more energy it's going to take. And um, so we talk about metrics that you can use for, you know, to establish how quality a circuit is. Uh, area of time and product or area of time squared. So energy delay or product of energy delay squared. All right. So uh, here are some of the big companies, Cadence, Synopsys, Mentor Graphics, Magma. I don't know about Magna. I, I haven't seen them, but I guess they're still in the picture. And of course, uh, there have been uh, these CPA uh, vendors, Xilinx, Altera, Octal, but uh, I don't know if some of them may have been bit bought up. I'm not sure. Um, one thing is really interesting, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but um, but the uh, uh, Xilinx is being purchased by um, uh, a Advanced Micro Devices, AMD. So that's really interesting. And what it kind of tells you is that, that uh, AMD has kind of gotten Intel a little bit on the ropes, and now they're just trying to really hurt them. Uh, so this is going to be uh, bloody and interesting to see how this sorts out. But at the moment, I'm not buying any Intel stock. So uh, it might be a really good idea to buy some uh, AMD stock and hold it. Uh, so we'll see. All right. We have to deal with placement. Uh, placement's important because it impacts routing. Uh, so we have synthesis, placement, routing. And uh, how the things get routed does make a difference on timing. Sometimes you have to go back and look at your clock lines and, and get involved in the routing, but that's about the most you can do with routing in an FPGA. Uh, if you want to control routing, then that's where you really have to get involved. That's where you, you know, you'd be making a, then an application-specific integrated circuit. All right. Um, all right, so that's that. Let me kill that one off. And, uh, sorry. And then we'll do the next one. How we're doing? Yeah, we're up to 42, so I don't know. Okay. Floating point arithmetic. So I'm not going to go through this. They, they played some games with these, uh, you know, 4-bit formats and stuff. I'm not going to do that. We're just we'll talk briefly about the IEEE 754 standard. You should know this. You d you don't have to know all the facts, but you should know roughly how the how the numbers are represented in single precision, which is 32 bits, called a float in C. Uh, if you if you uh, use a floating point number in Verilog, then it's going to be in 754 format, and it's going to be 32 bits or 64. I think I think the ones in thinking in Verilog, they're all they're all doubles, uh, but in any event, uh, you can see that that uh, we are, you know that more and more and more we're we have we're bringing great computing power to processors. So more and more we're 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 tending to tending to do things um, tending to do things with floating point. When you do control theory, uh, if you use fixed point. It, we used to always use fixed point because we just didn't have the time to uh, to do things in floating point. Processors might not be fast enough. Uh, now that they can do uh, things very fast in floating point with coprocessors and all that, there's been a real increased interest in, in doing our uh, control theorems in floating point. And you can get, uh, you can get, um, you know, a little more, a um, little more precision uh, and accuracy because you're using a lot more bits than you were using with just a fixed point notation. Uh, plus, you were with certain math operations, you're truncating, uh, throwing away the fractional portions and stuff. All right, so the one I want you to kind of remember here is this uh, basic format. One sign bit, eight bits of exponent, but remember the exponent 
is biased by 127. So you add, have to add 127 to it. So if your exponent was say, if it was your exponent was say three, then you it'd be 130 instead because you add 127. And what that allows you to do is to have uh, minus three. Now you only, now you would have uh, 124. And so it makes them uh, more sortable than if you did two's complement here. And then you have 23 bits of significant. Now you really have 24 bits because you uh, you always normalize the number. And when you normalize it, you normalize it so that there's a one, a single one. You shift the number until you get a single one to the left of the decimal, of the binary point. And, and then all the other bits to the right of the binary point then uh, that's what you store, and you can store up to 23 of those while well, you store 23 bits. You may not have 23 bits, but if, if you do, you can store 23 bits. The one on the left of the decimal point is assumed, but not stored. So you're only storing 23 bits. Um, and uh, we can use the word significant. That's probably the best one. Fraction is also used. Mantissa is another one that's used. So if somebody talks about significant, mantissa, or fraction, that they should be referring to these 23 bits. All right. Um, so remember, and then in double precision, uh, well, in single precision, we bias by 127. Okay, so that gives us a range of exponents from, from 1 to 254. But of course, uh, you know, we... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, one of the things that happens is, yeah, one, 1 to 254, because an exponent of 0 and an exponent of 255 are special cases. And we have a bunch of special cases. And, you you, you know, you should kind of know about the special cases, okay? Um, all right. I'm not going to go through that. I'm not going to go through double precision. But here the, here the, the blue are the single precision special cases. The green are the double precision. Remember, since... Everything's in normalized form where there's always a one that's assumed to the left of the binary point. You can't represent zero because you're assuming that there's always a one there and zero can't have that one. So zero becomes a special case. And for a number to be zero, the exponent zero and the significant zero. So basically, sine zero, exponent zero, significant zero. So that's a zero. So zero is zero. Uh, infinity you make the exponent the maximum one that's illegal. It's not, not a legal exponent, and that's 255. And then your significant is zero, so that's infinity. On the other hand, if you have a non-zero significant with a maximum exponent, that's considered not a number. And then we allow these denormalized numbers where we, where we, don't, uh, where we don't shift them uh, till there's a one to the left of the decimal point, because if we did do that, we would uh, blow through our maximum uh, exponent. And so what we then allow is we allow a, a denormalized number, and that's when the exponent is zero, but the significant is non-zero. And, and it, that just allows us to represent smaller numbers than we could if we insisted that they were all normalized. Okay, those are the, those are the exceptions. And then, um, yeah. And remember, affinity can be plus or minus because you still have a sine bit here that's not included in this. You can have plus or minus zero, but we normally would never use minus zero. Uh, and then uh, not a number, can, uh, I guess it could be plus or minus. But again, it's really just not a number. Okay, and which means an invalid operation, like divide by zero or other things. All right. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on the denormalized numbers. Uh, we went through that. Hopefully, you kind of understood what was going on there. But don't. It's not a big deal if you don't understand it. Uh, what is important to understand, so this would be, a, see, there's no 1 to the left of the point. So that's why it has to be a special case. All right. Um, um, okay. When you multiply these numbers, you just, you, you, you just uh, you multiply the, the significants and add the exponents. Okay. And then uh, when you're, um, yeah, when you're, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through this. If you add 
two, two of these floating point numbers, you then you you do you modify them to make the exponents equal, and then you add them, and then you renormalize it. So you normally you normally right shift the fraction with the smaller exponent until that exponent's equal to the larger exponent. Okay, and that's that's all you do. And subtraction, uh, same as adder, you, it's just two's complement. Division's a little different, and uh, so you have to handle the special cases. Uh, you have to subtract the exponents and divide the fractions. All right, now you also have to contend with rounding rules for the, those very last couple of digits. And uh, so there are five different rounding rules, and I don't care if you remember these, uh, but the, the default rounding rule is ties to, ties to even and uh, or so, yeah, so uh, rounding to nearest uh, ties to even, I think. Let's see, yeah. Okay, and this just shows. You can look at these. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, okay, and here's some, of the, here's some of the recommended operations that have to round correctly. Uh, and then there's some new formats starting last year. Uh, we used to just have single and double precision. That was it. Now we have... Uh, half precision, single precision is 32, but half precision is 16. Uh, and then we've added quadruple and octuple precision. And then we have some decimal representations. So those are all the new formats. The old formats were just single and double. All right. Let's see. We're making good progress here. Uh, okay. So uh, I don't think there's a whole lot in this one that I want to cover. We kind of went through this comparator and how we would do that. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to go through it, but I'm not, not going to ask you any questions about that. We already went through it. But we will talk about Verilog functions, Verilog tasks, uh, multivalued logic. Uh, we won't talk about the RAM, uh, but we will talk about parameters. Named association. Um, not going to test you on generate statements, but we'll talk briefly about file functions. All right, and I think I may, I may just quit with this. Uh, we'll see. This is eight. Uh, I think this really covers almost everything. All right, so, uh, so often we have repeated use of similar structures. This is, this is certainly true in a lot of, a lot of, in a lot of uh, very large-scale integrated circuits, and, it, and it's often true in some of our very log uh, 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 files when we do any programmable logic. And so when you have a lot of repeated use of similar structures, you can use functions or tasks to do this. All right. Both, both functions and tasks can be defined within a module. So that's nice. Uh, or you can have them in separate files and include them with an include directive. So that's also nice. The, the function returns a value uh, by assigning the value to the function name. And you can, you can use the function basically in any expression. Um, functions cannot call tasks, but they can call other functions. And the, the function can only return a single variable, but it can, be a, it can be a single bit or it can be a vector. All right. Uh, generally, a function models combinational logic. It does not have, not allowed to have any delays. You can have as many inputs as you want, but you only get the one output. However, it can be a vector. And uh, you specify the size of the vector in the uh, declaration. And then you use local variables uh, or global variables so that uh, generally in a function, you, you, in, you create local variables that, that have no scope outside that function. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so here's what a function. Um, there's a prototype for the function definition. So, function and then uh, ranger type. Basically, you have the function name, and then uh, you have the input declarations. So, when you call the function, so here's an example. So. Uh, function 7 to 0, rotate right. So 
rotate right is the name of the function and it's also the, the return variable and it's going to be eight bits and then inside the function uh, and then you're going to then uh, you're going to pass to the function uh, an 8-bit register address so that's specified in here and then the function's going to rotate that address and then it's going to then it's going to it's going to set that 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 shifted address and in this case we're going to shift it one place to the right or rotate it one place to the right and then we're going to assign that new value to rotate right and then that's the end of the function so what it'll do uh, so the way you do it is you pass that variable in parentheses b equals rotate right a so a is is the input variable and remember you can have a number of input parameters uh, so when you implement it, you have the function name with the actual parameter list. And uh, so if you put in A equals 1001010101, it returns B, uh, shifts it to the uh, right one, one place, and it's going to it's gonna take that one and flip it around to the other end, and it's going to be 11001010. So it's going to rotate it right. And that's what the three arrows mean. All right. Uh, here's, a, here's a function parity. It, it's going to return four, uh, five bits, but the input's four bits. And what it's going to do, it's going to add a parity bit. And here, the parity bit's going to be the low level bit, the low, the low order bit. And uh, that's how it's going to do it. Uses a four input exclusive OR. And then here's how you would you would write it. Y equals parity X, where X is a 4-bit vector, and it's returning a Y would be a 5-bit vector with a, the, the appended parity bit. And so I, I don't think I'm going to spend any more time on that. Functions are a good way to reuse procedural code since modules cannot be invoked from a procedure. So remember, inside a always block, you can't call a module, but you can call a function. So that's one good way to have... To, to be able to write multiple things within that always block. Um, so here's some general rules. Um, functions have to contain at least one input argument. They cannot contain an input or an output declaration. So you can't, you, you, there's no declaration. They cannot contain time control statements. So propagation delays, weights, uh, things like that. Functions cannot enable tasks. And functions must contain a statement that assigns that return value to the function name. Okay, tasks. Unlike functions, tasks do not return a value. Tasks can calculate multiple result values. A task is very much like a module uh, because you 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 have you instantiate it on a separate line, unlike a function that can appear as part of an expression. And and it has to be specifically called within a statement. You can't use it in the middle of an expression, again, like a function can be. And uh, it can be sequential or concurrent. And basically, it's tax name, parenthesis, and the actual parameter list, very much like a function or like a module, only you don't, you don't have the module keyword. All right. So... You can define it in the module that it's going to be used in or in a separate file, just like functions. It can include timing delays, so you often can use tasks in test, uh, uh, in test benches. So here's add vector, where A, B, and sum are four-bit data, and carry in and carry out are bits. So, so this, would be a, this would be a little adder as a, as a task. And here's, why they, here's how, how they look when they're written out. Uh, so you have a parameter list, three inputs, and two outputs. Two of them are vectors here in one single bit, and one vector sum, and one carry out. And you define some internal signals, and then you can, and then here's what it looks like. All right. So these are sections of very log code that allow uh, allow you to write more reusable, easier to read code. And they're very handy in test benches because they can include timing delays. 
and that's kind of one of the big differences. Uh, the two big differences between tasks and functions, uh, uh, ta functions uh, can Im be embedded in, in expressions, but tasks can't. They have to appear on a single line, much like a module instantiation. And, uh, and tasks can have multiple outputs, whereas uh, functions can only have a single output, but it can be a vector. They both can have any number of inputs, uh, but tasks can include delays and functions can't. All right. So whenever you're having repetitive pieces of code, you should think through and try and use a task or a function. And yes, they can be synthesized. All right, for value logic, simple. It's just unknown, high, disconnected or high impedance, and zero and one. X, zero, one, Z. That's all. All right, um, tri state buffers. That's where we can use this constant with a, with a disconnected. So here, you output a one, or if uh, or if b doesn't equal one, then you uh, well if b equals one, you output an a. That's your control line. If if b is zero, then you output disconnected. All right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the SRAM model uh, parameters. We've talked about parameters earlier, uh, and basically they're just a way to specify constants. Uh, but they're nice because you can change parameters every time you instantiate a module. So a module could be instantiated with each time with different parameters. And you can use defparm statements uh, with a logic path, with a, with a sort of a pathway, uh, and that defparm statement then can, uh, can be anywhere in your code, not even in the same module that you're, uh, where you're changing parameters. That's why it's a little bit dangerous to use, and there are a number of companies that have outlawed them just because they... Uh, they can cause uh, they can cause bugs that you can that's just very difficult to find. Um, so if you just get rid of your defparm statements, you won't have to worry about it. And really, I don't know. It's it's but it is one way to change to change. I don't know. It's one way to change things without having to dig down into the module. But you still have to know, you know, top level module name, the instantiation name, and the parameter name in order to change it with a defparm. Um, when you change parameters, you you can you can have more than one, and you can have them uh, you can have them in a list just like this, uh, and uh, you can use positional notation or dot notation. Uh, they can also involve calculations, and I'm not going to go through. I think that's good. Um, these are some good examples. Um, okay, named association and positional. So named association, uh, so we've been mostly using positional association, but some of you have been using uh, the named association. In the named association, we take the names from the, the names from the definition of your module, and you put dots. So, so the module is defined as C out, sum, X, Y, and carry in. Now, you know when you instantiate it, you don't have to use these names. In fact, you generally don't use these names. You need use whatever names are relevant to your to the to the module uh, to the code in the module you're going to instantiate this. If you want to use positional notation, then your new names have to be your carry out new name has to be first, and then the, the sum new name, then the x new name, the y new name, and the carry in new name. But if you want to mix them out or leave some out, then you have to use dot notation, and the you pl use the original names in the definition, and then in parentheses you put the the actual variables you want to you want to pass for that value, and now you can put them in any order you want. All right, and uh, generate statements. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about these, but again, generate statements are a good way to uh, to generate repetitive uh, list lines of code. Uh, where you can change a few parameters, but uh, you can you know you have an index maybe, uh, but it's just a good way to to generate uh, repetitive code, um, and I think generally it, it's used for uh, uh, concurrent statements, and you can have conditional generates uh, anyway. We're not going to ask you file I/O functions. So there's a there's a you can definitely use these file I.O. functions, but they can only be used in a test bench. They are not synthesizable. 
and this is a good way to open up uh, some exemplar files that you're going to run against your top level module in your test bench. Uh, if you have a big module and you want to run a bunch of exemplars, uh, then this was a good way to do it. You can also save the output so you can go back and check them uh, with another program or whatever. But normally you check them in the test bench. Um, and here they are. Uh, open and close. Uh, test for end the file. Test for an error on a read. Uh, get a single character. Put a single character. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, read scanned formatted text in and write out formatted text string. And then um, binary data, read binary data, write binary data. And yeah, so that's it. All right. I think that's all I'm going to cover. So that should be a good review and we'll talk to you later.